Hi everyone, this is the first part of my three-part sequence on three important macroeconomic topics, GDP, inflation, and unemployment. I'll be referring to these as the big three macro concepts. I decided to record these two chapters because the concepts introduced in these chapters are relatively straightforward with a lot of definitions and calculations. This information, however, will be important for us to study monetary and fiscal policy to wrap up this semester. Of course, you can always email me or talk to me before or after class if you have any questions on this material. So far, we have been studying microeconomics, which studies how firms and consumers interact. This chapter starts our transition to the macroeconomics third of the semester, in which we will study changes to the overall economy as opposed to a particular product. For example, we have previously studied how a decrease in supply and or an increase in demand increases the price for a particular product from a microeconomics perspective. In macroeconomics, if the price for all products increase, then the economy would experience something called inflation. More on inflation in the video for part two of this chapter. Before we get into inflation or unemployment, we first want to discuss gross domestic product, or GDP. As we discussed on the first day of class, GDP is a measure of the overall production in a country. In particular, it is the dollar value of final goods produced in a given time period. Each of these phrases were crucial in our definition. First, notice that in macroeconomics, production is in terms of dollars as opposed to quantities like in microeconomics. Next, we focus on final goods as opposed to intermediate goods, which are raw materials used in the production of final goods, in order to avoid double counting the value of these raw materials. For example, Ford uses aluminum to produce the body of its F-150 truck. Since the value of the aluminum used would presumably be incorporated in the retail value of the truck, we do not include Ford's cost to purchase aluminum in our country's GDP. Finally, we focus on current production, not used goods. An F-150 purchased in 2012 is included in the United States GDP in 2012. If that truck then gets sold to a second owner in 2017, then that value is not reflected in 2017 since we do not want to double count the value of the truck that was already included in 2012's GDP. The data for this graph, as well as many other graphs associated with macroeconomic variables, comes from the St. Louis Fed's Federal Reserve Economic Data, or FRED. We will discuss the Federal Reserve System in more detail in Chapter 13, but for now, Notice that GDP has a general upward or even exponential trend over time. Since GDP is measured on the y-axis in terms of billions of dollars, the fact that the US GDP in 2015 was just over $18 trillion means that the associated point on the graph is $18,000 billion. One last thing to note about FRED graphs is that recessions are illustrated as gray vertical bars. There is a noticeable drop in GDP during the Great Recession from 2007 to 2009. More on recessions in the video for part 3 of this chapter. As we discussed on the first day of class, GDP, which is denoted using the letter Y, consists of five components. What consumers buy, or C, what companies invest in machines, buildings, or other physical capital, or I, what the government spends, or G, and net exports, X minus M. This figure shows that the United States GDP in 2012 was $16.245 trillion. Household consumption makes up the majority of GDP, followed by government expenditures and business investment. Notice that net exports was actually negative in 2012, meaning that the U.S. imported more than we exported. We focused a lot of our attention in the microeconomics portion of the class on price analysis. Surely, price is a big factor when analyzing macroeconomic topics as well. Indeed, one of the weaknesses in our GDP calculation so far is that we did not take price changes over time into consideration. Perhaps it's the case that GDP, which again is measured in dollars, increased solely because the price of products produced in the United States increased. Since GDP is really meant to be a measure of production, we will learn in the next few slides how to control for price in our GDP calculations. So far in this video, we have been analyzing nominal GDP, which is the value of GDP in current year prices. However, if we want to control for price changes over time in order to get a more accurate measure of production, then we will need to calculate real GDP. 
In order to calculate real GDP, we will first need to choose a base year. We can use the base year to control for price changes since we will hold the prices for products constant at that particular base year. It doesn't really matter what year we use for the base year, but it's customary among economists to use 2009 as the base year. We'll use a basic numerical example to discuss how the base year affects our calculations for nominal and real GDP. In order to simplify our calculations, let's suppose that there are only three products produced in a country. To calculate nominal GDP in 2014, we add up the spending on each of these three products based on the price in 2014. For example, 100 eye exams that cost $50 each result in a total spending of $5,000 on eye exams. Similarly, we can calculate that spending on pizzas and shoes is $800 and $2,000, respectively, leading to a nominal GDP in 2014 of $7,800. Now if we want to calculate real GDP in 2014 using 2009 as our base year, we add up the spending on each of these three products, but this time we use the price from 2009. So instead of calculating 100 eye exams that cost $50 each, we now calculate 100 eye exams using the price of eye exams in 2009, or $40. Therefore, total spending on eye exams in the real GDP calculation is $4,000. Similarly, we can calculate that spending on pizzas and shoes is $880 and $1,800, respectively, leading to a real GDP in 2009 of $6,680, which is a smaller value than the nominal GDP value that we calculated in the previous slide. One last thing to note here is that the nominal GDP and real GDP must be the same in the base year since prices used in the nominal GDP calculation is the same as the prices used in the real GDP calculation. I use data from Fred to create this graph. The blue line is nominal GDP which is the same as the line you saw earlier when I first introduced GDP in this video. Now I also include the red line which is real GDP. Notice that we still get a steady upward trend for real GDP, with the exception of the Great Recession from 2007 and 2009. Also, the real GDP line is flatter than the nominal GDP line, since real GDP controls for price changes over time. Finally, the real GDP line intersects the nominal GDP line at the base year, which in this case is 2009. Since the calculation for real GDP and nominal GDP is the same in the base year. The GDP deflator uses the nominal GDP and real GDP calculations to measure how price changes over time. We calculate the GDP deflator as nominal GDP divided by real GDP and then multiplied by 100. In the next two slides, we'll see how we can use the GDP deflator to calculate changes in the overall price level in an economy. The table on this slide presents actual values of U.S. nominal and real GDP in 2009, 2010, and 2011 using 2009 as the base year. Again, we calculate the GDP deflator as the nominal GDP divided by the real GDP and then multiplied by 100. Since the nominal GDP is the same as the real GDP in the base year, and we use 2009 as our base year here, then the GDP deflator for 2009 is equal to 100. Using the data in the table, we can calculate the GDP deflator for 2010 as approximately 101.22 and the GDP deflator for 2011 as approximately 103.31. We can now use the GDP deflator calculations from the previous slide to analyze the price changes from one year to the next. We use the standard calculation for a rate of change, which is new minus old over old times 100, to get the percent change in price from one year to the next. We calculate that prices increase by 1.22% between 2009 and 2010 since the GDP deflator in 2010 was calculated as 101.22 and the GDP deflator in 2009 was calculated as 100. We can similarly calculate that prices further increase by 2.06% from 2010 to 2011 keeping in mind that the GDP deflator in 2011 was 103.31. Although we can use the GDP deflator to calculate the overall price change in an economy over time, this is not the commonly used way of calculating inflation that you hear about in the news. More on this in the next video.
Before proceeding to part two of the three-part sequence, I encourage you to take some time playing with the Excel spreadsheet I provided on Moodle to make sure you can replicate the calculations covered in this video. Remember, you'll be able to use the Excel spreadsheet on the final exam, so it's in your best interest to make sure that you are comfortable with the calculations introduced in this video. Feel free to email me with any questions that you have.